Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank you so much for joining Family Caregiver Alliance for our webinar today, Seasons of Care. My name is Paige Harvey. I am the Education Coordinator at Family Caregiver Alliance, and I'm also the organizer for this webinar. For over 35 years, Family Caregiver Alliance has been working throughout the Bay Area to improve the well-being of family and friends who are providing long-term care. We offer support through educational classes, workshops, fact sheets, retreats, research, advocacy, and so much more. The first thing I'd like to do is address a few housekeeping tasks. I want to point out that your phone will be muted during the entire presentation, and that only means that you can hear us, but we can't hear you. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to type them in the GoToMeeting question box on your screen, and we will be taking your questions at the end of the webinar. On that note, I want to start by saying if there is anyone who has a birthday today or yesterday or tomorrow, please feel free to type that into your um, chat box so we can see that. Um, we have a special little exercise, and we just want to know if it's anyone's birthday today. Also, um, concluding this presentation, you will receive an email asking you to complete a survey about the educational program you participated in. Please just take a moment to share your thoughts. Your feedback is very important to us because it helps us shape future educational programming. And I will be introducing the speakers in just one moment. But first, I want to thank our local areas on aging, including the counties of Alameda, Contra Costa, San Francisco, San Mateo, and Marin for their support in making this webinar happen. Our speakers this afternoon are Andrea Sherman and Marsha Wieners, the co-founder of Transitional Keys. And at this time, I'd like to turn it over to them. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Andrea, and I'm delighted to be here today along with my colleague, Marsha Wiener from Seasons of Care. We want to thank Family Caregivers Alliance for their commitment to bringing resources to caregivers across the country. Today, we're going to share our program, Seasons of Care, which is a program of transitional keys, and our wellness tools for family caregivers like yourself. Our work is inspired by both the contemplative and the expressive arts, and it uses ritual to encourage self-care practice. My background is as a gerontologist for more than 35 years, a dancer choreographer, as well as caregiver to my father. And these are the things that have influenced me personally in the development of Seasons of Care. My colleague and co-creator will share more about our program. We invite you to take the next 45 minutes to take the time and truly practice self-care. Next. OK, I'm Marcia, and I want to thank Family Caregivers Alliance and all of you for joining us today. The objectives we've set out for our webinar today specifically and also generally for Seasons of Care are to use the contemplative and expressive arts to strengthen resilience, to express and release feelings through creative expression, to increase ease, comfort, and happiness through meditation, and to decrease the stresses that produce burnout. From all that we've learned about caregiver burnout, and from all we've experienced personally as caregivers, we know that these are achievable objectives that will ensure the health and well-being of caregivers. Next. Caregiving is often described as a journey. And whenever you go on a journey, it's not uncommon to get a guidebook. One guidebook that I found very helpful and comforting is The Caregiver's Tao Te Ching by William and Nancy Marlin. This husband and wife team bring decades of combined experience in Taoist scholarship along with hospice, Zen hospice care and counseling. In this slim book, they have adapted the classic contemplative text of the Tao Te Ching to assist us on the unpredictable journey of caregiving. For me, this quote beautifully describes that journey, because caregiving does not unfold in an, orderly, in an orderly fashion. It evades easy answers. We would like to wrap it up in neat bundles of conclusions we can rely on, but it refuses to be tidy. It is sometimes gratifying, often frustrating, and always a mystery. Next.
the legendary Lao Tzu wrote the Tao Te Ching 2,600 years ago, and we could consider contemplation was a technology quite different from today, when, we're, when our era is being revolutionized by the high-tech science of neurobiology, which, was reveal, which is revealing how our brains function. Different from the psychological era of the 20th century, scientists are now learning about the neuroplasticity of our brains and what we can do to influence the wiring of the neural networks that profoundly influence our choices, our habits, our overall mental and well-being. Next. Researchers are studying how the contemplative practices influence the brain. Olympic-level meditators, people who have lived in contemplative communities, have been hooked up to computers and put into MRI machines to see what areas of the brain are engaged and change over time with ongoing and deepening meditative practice. There is also research into the role and effect of creativity and well-being. So when we decided to, to produce a wellness program for caregivers to promote, we decided to focus on the contemplative and expressive arts. We found that contemplative arts can focus attention inside oneself, can rekindle inner resources, help discover sources of resiliency, and help caregivers connect with something greater than oneself. The expressive, the expressive arts allow a release of energy outward with color, dance, song, and declaration, can enhance overwhelm, can enhance well-being, and can uplift spirits. Next. Recently, I heard a talk by Dr. Richard Davidson, who's one of the neuroscientists at the forefront of studying how contemplative practice can impact brain development. He said something kind of funny. He said that meditation was like sports meaning that there are so many different kinds of sports, football, hockey, swimming, jogging, and that similarly there are a wide variety, different types of meditation. One form of meditation that has been embraced by the medical and therapeutic communities is mindfulness meditation. The pioneering mindfulness-based stress reduction program founded by Dr. John Kabat-Zinn at the Massachusetts General Medical Center has been seminal in launching a mindfulness explosion. There's even a book recently published by Congressman Tim Ryan of Ohio called A Mindful Nation, How a Simple Practice Can Help Us Reduce Stress, Improve Performance, and Recapture the American Spirit. Here are some of the benefits of mindfulness meditation. It can increase the ability to relax, decrease psychological symptoms, reduce pain levels, increase the ability to cope with chronic pain. Next. Meditation also encourages greater enthusiasm for life, improves self-esteem, increases the ability to cope more effectively with stressful situations that are beyond one's control. I think we can all easily agree that these benefits are especially valuable for family caregivers. Next. So in creating Seasons of Care, we produced a series of meditations specifically crafted for caregivers. There are varying lengths, some shorter and some longer, given the, the very jumbled, jumbled schedules most caregivers have. Titles such as Sanctuary, The Healing Power of Water, and Catch Your Breath. So I'd like to take the next two minutes and have us in this webinar, in our webinar today, just have a simple catch your breath meditation. So if you would, sit comfortably at your chair, wherever you are. Take a deep breath in and a deep breath out. Have your hands rest gently in your laps. Close your eyes if you'd like, and for two minutes, we invite you to catch your breath. Bring your attention to your breath, 
Don't try to manipulate it. No reason to count. Just bring your mind to the inhalation, the natural exhalation of your breath. You might find that your attention more easily goes to the movement in your belly. Or you might find that your attention naturally goes to the sensation of the breath in your nostrils. Just have that gentle inner focus on this intimate experience of the environment through your breath. With each inhalation and exhalation, you can experience letting go. If you can relax your hands, if you can relax your feet, if you can relax the muscles in your face, Pay attention to that gentle inner sensation of your breath. Anytime throughout the day, you can always take two minutes to catch our breath. Okay, next slide, please. The expressive arts have also, are also been, it's also, there's also evidence coming out about the wellness benefits of expressive arts, including to enhance coping skills, to manage stress, to strengthen a sense of self, to enhance the quality of life for both the patient and the caregiver. And the expressive arts also allow for communication when words just aren't enough. And I have to say that last value, when words just aren't enough, really, really resonates with me. Uh, both Andrea and I have some personal experience of using the arts when we were family caregivers. Next. Which we'd like to share with you. Here are two collages when, uh, when Andre was caring for her father when she lost him a couple of years ago. To help her process her grief, she made a journal of collages, finding images and words in magazines and newspapers, helped her express the powerful feelings of dealing with the loss of her dad. And what I find really wonderful is that she never done collage before, and so she was surprised with how deeply rewarding doing these daily daily uh, collages were. And what's also interesting about the form of collage is that aside from finding words that you can identify with and finding images that can help you express yourself, you can also use, um, you can also use artifacts and memorabilia. And then at the end, you have a family keepsake. Next. My experience of being a family caregiver happened this, began this past March when my 89-year-old father, who's blind and has dementia, had the life-changing fall and fractured his lumbar spine. As the only sibling on the East Coast, my 89-year-old my father and my 85-year-old mother, who has a lame leg from a mild stroke, then fell into my care. Um, as you can imagine, as you all know, there was a swirl of feelings in the beginning of that process. And I found myself, I downloaded one of those free drawing apps onto my iPad. And I began to do these daily drawings. I don't know if you call them drawings or paintings, but this is, this is I began to do a series of these, these color things. This one I call the Landscape of the Forgiven. I think that, well, I know that for family caregivers, forgiveness it's a very powerful emotion that, that comes and goes in various forms. And I did a whole series of these. This first one that was called the, I called the Landscape of the Forgiven. Next slide.
so it's easy to ask how to get started with the expressive arts. I think it's, I think I dare say that most of us at some point in our lives have, had a, have held a crayon in our hand. So I say, grab some crayons and take a second and give yourself a break to consider a little rewiring of your own brain. It's not uncommon for someone to ask, well, what's your favorite color? And you may traditionally, uh, by out of habit, just say, oh, my favorite color is purple or blue or yellow. But give yourself a break and consider what color do you want now? What color best represents your mood? Maybe you have a new favorite color just for today. Playing with color is kind of like taking vitamins. It can shift your mood and it can even strengthen your immune system. Next, next slide, please. I did a series of landscapes as I shared with you before. And to start a landscape, all you need is a horizon line. So here's a horizon line for you to begin your own series of landscapes. And don't think, don't hesitate to, to change the color scheme in your mind. Maybe the sky is purple or the grass is orange. Just feel the colors that are right for you. Next slide. Writing is also a profound wellness tool. It is integrative. It's a self-reflective technique that promotes meaningful engagement with the, with the self. Next slide, please. Here are some rules of writing by Natalie Goldberg. Keep your hand moving. Don't cross out a thought. Don't worry about spelling, punctuation, or grammar. Let yourself lose control. Don't think. Don't get logical. Go for the jugular. If something comes up that is scary or naked, dive into it. There's a lot of energy there. Obviously, the point she's trying to make is don't edit yourself. Don't hesitate. Let your, express yourself. Next slide, please. As an inspiration to getting started with writing as a, as a wellness tool, Julia Cameron says, just as a good rain clears the air, a good writing day clears the psyche. So to get started after this webinar, here's a, here's a sentence to fill in the blanks. As the blank comes and goes, I blank. Maybe that's a possible narrative starter for you after the webinar. So thank you for letting me share with you how we use the contemplative and expressive arts in seasons of care. And now I turn it back to Andrea. Thank you, Marsha. Next slide. So um, the contemplative and expressive arts come together in ritual. And when we use the word ritual, right now we're talking about secular, everyday ritual. Um, you can think about religious rituals as well, but for this conversation, it's um, secular ritual. And rituals are used to mark a specific event, time, or activity, and to give that, to imbue it with meaning. And as a family caregiver, you can use the contemplative and the expressive arts to create simple rituals that help diminish stress and can convert routine moments of caregiving into meaning and renewal. For example, think about how you enter the room of the person that you're caring for. That is a really great opportunity for a ritual practice. So when you enter the room of the person, and care for, you can do the ritual of taking a pause. And we're back to catching your breath. If you enter into also and step back in a difficult situation, breathing in and out, and letting yourself settle first, this pausing and letting go is a simple ritual that can ease your caregiving. So I encourage you to practice that pause. Put the pause into your day. Next slide. So ritual provides order and clarity in times of change, and relief and comfort in times of anxiety, integration and healing in times of loss, and continuity and community in times of celebration and reflect, reflection. Ritual can be used as an antidote to routine and task-oriented caregiving 
and it increases person-centered caregiving. And you know, in the person-centered care model, it's you taking care of the person and it's you taking care of yourself. Both of those are really important parts of person-centered care. So entrances and exits and caregiving interactions can be done with an intention to practice self-care. Not only can you take a moment to really catch your breath before you enter someone's room, you could also take a moment to shrug and release your shoulders, to bend and straighten your legs, to sigh, to hum, or even to laugh and recall a funny event. By the same token, after a caregiving interaction, you can also introduce a self-care expressive practice. You could inhale and exhale with the intention of consciously releasing any stress that you feel and deeply letting go. I think that using the breath is a really important self-care practice as well as taking a pause before your next activity. And it's a way to ritualize caregiving and increase your sense of well-being. Another uh, ritual of self-care that you could do is to drink a glass of water after an especially intense caregiving experience. And when you do it, to consciously cleanse yourself and contemplate an awareness of drinking a refreshing glass of water. So the distinction here is between something that you do habitually, like drinking a glass of water or a cup of coffee, and then doing that same activity and pausing and taking a moment before you do it. Next slide. Another element of ritual is affirmation. And I'm sure that many of you have affirmations that you use throughout the day. Next slide. So according to um, the Research Laboratory for Effective Neuroscience and Dr. Richard Davidson, affirmations, practicing them, can increase our immune response and also increase empathy and compassion and mitigate some of the stress of caregiving, perhaps lessen our irritability and grumpiness and increase our happiness. A simple affirmation is in the book of the little engine that could, the train that keeps saying, and I ask you to join me in saying, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. It's a wonderful, powerful affirmation. Next slide. And in between this, because we're inviting you also to practice self-care as we go along, I'd like to ask you all now to take a deep breath in and let it out with a sigh, an audible sigh, and another deep breath in and a sigh. Um, Marsha and I developed a series of affirmation cards that are wellness cards for caregivers. And they're in four different themes. And there's a front side and a back side. And um, they're really designed to address very specific aspects of burnout. For instance, in this one, you see affirm and celebrate. Because often, it's too easy in caregiving to forget to take the time to celebrate, to really acknowledge that while caregiving. Next slide. Um, the second stream is the Connect group. And um, we feel like one of the things that happens to many caregivers is that we forget to connect. We forget to connect with other people. We forget to connect with nature. We forget to connect with ourselves. That, or we may even remain way too isolated. So um, connecting is another aspect of mitigating burnout. Even if you take the time, like in this slide, to connect with the sky, to really connect with nature, and um, uh, appreciate nature. Next slide. Uh, this is another 
stream. This is the power of the heart. And um, this one is because often there's so many emotional uh, challenges that we're facing as we're caregiving that sometimes our love gets lost. And this one would be a, a affirmation on compassion and the power of the heart, truly. And you can post these at your desk or in your room, on your mirror. You could have a, a private moment of contemplation and reflection or write your own affirmation, some affirmation that might be specific to your caregiving experience. Next slide. And the fourth um, stream of cards is the Guiding Lights cards. And um, these are, it's pretty self-explanatory that often light and guidance are two things that are missing in our caregiving experience that we feel like we're in the dark or um, just lost and that we need, we really need light. So I'd like to ask you for a moment just to look at the Lighten Up card. Take a few moments just to look at it and to see that wonderful, colorful kite and the word Lighten Up. And wherever you are, I invite you to say the words out loud, lighten up. And if you're not comfortable saying it out loud, just say it to yourself. And um, to invite you th for the rest of today to take two opportunities during your day, perhaps when you're getting tense or stressed or feeling frustrated, where you take a moment and you either say it quietly to yourself or out loud, lighten up. Sometimes when I say it, I, I say to myself, lighten up, Andrea. It's like a gentle nudge that, you know, I've taken things far too seriously as a caregiver. So I hope for the rest of today that you will have two lighten up experiences. Next slide. So the challenge for all caregivers as we continue on our journey is to remember to care for yourself so that you can really balance and handle some of the feelings of hopelessness, anger, or perhaps despair that you might be feeling. And to care for yourself using contemplative and expressive arts can help with caring for your loved one with compassion because Self-care is compassionate care. And we're back to that idea of person-centered care and that we are people, too, that need to be cared for and to have a compassionate attitude to ourselves on the caregiver's journey. Next slide. Sometimes it's as simple as a post-it that says, reminder, take care of myself. Self-care is a practice with both the contemplative and expressive arts. And within this, it's important to care for your body, your mind, and your spirit. And to create a sanctuary, an inner home. And this increases your resilience and renewal throughout the day. So taking time to choose activities that renew you and engage your creativity and creative expression promote vitality and joy. Next slide. Here's our happiness bank account. I guess we might call her Miss Piggy. And happiness can bo be both contemplative and expressive. And happiness is a really vital element of resilience. That ability to bring back from disappointment and setbacks. We all know what happiness feels like, even if right now we are not happy. So um, I'd like to ask you to think of a moment when you felt happy. It can be a recent one, um, one from your childhood. But identify a time when you truly felt happy. 
and to contemplate what happiness feels like. How does your face feel? How does your stomach feel when you were happy? How are your shoulders? Are you smiling? Are you talking to yourself? Are you shaking? Your body knows what happiness feels like. And you can put that happiness feeling in the bank, in your happiness bank account. And just like savings in the bank, it can be there for a rainy day. Once you contemplate happiness and then express it, it's there for a dividend that keeps on giving. And um, research shows that those who find positive meaning in their caregiving and in their life experience less depression and better quality of life. And Marcia spoke earlier about the wiring of the brain. And research shows us that, unfortunately, we remember negative experiences more than positive ones. And that's another reason why it's really important when you do experience happiness to take a few moments and really um, soak it in so that that happiness is in your bank account, so that you remember it. Um, so I encourage you to do that. I know um, I, I live in New York, and I, everything has been out of service. And finally today, the swimming pool in our club opened up, and I hit the water, and I, was, I just felt exuberant just to do something that I hadn't done in about 10 days. But, and I really took the time to soak it in. So whatever it might be for you. Next slide. So we invite you to waken and embrace joy. This is also very connected to happiness. So I ask you to think about um, a time When you felt very joyous, what quality did you feel? Did you feel light or energetic or open? Again, remember these sensations of joy and put it into your account. Recalling this contemplation on happiness and joy can awaken and renew you when you feel frustrated or exhausted from caregiving. Next slide. And don't forget the music. There's so much research now about the value of music and how it reduces stress and lowers blood pressure and reduces pain, releases emotions, has very healing effects, particularly on our mood and positive feelings. And this could be very personal you, whether you listen to music in your car, the radio, singing. I took a happiness course and they actually recommended that every day you sing, that it really is a great way to increase your happiness is to sing every day, to play the drum. Music can be really transcendent. So besides being expressive, it can be calming and relaxing and transporting. It's the language of emotions, and it can help us communicate that which is beyond words. So take a music break. Take a music bath. Take a music spa. Express yourself in music and the contemplative moments of joy. Don't forget the music. Next slide. Hello? Hello? Bye. Andrea, are you still there? Hello? Andrea, we can hear you. Oh, you can? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's funny. There was a very strange noise happening on the, um, on the webinar, so I apologize to everyone. So we know the importance of hand washing. This is, the Center for Disease Control has stated that to really get your hands clean, 
and to avoid spreading germs to yourself and others, that we should lather with soap for the amount of time it takes to sing happy birthday two times. And this is the sort of caregiving activity that is perfect and simple. It's a ritual that you can do throughout the day. So I understand that it was Sheila's birthday on November 4th. So uh, the person that we're going to sing happy birthday to in this hand washing ritual is Sheila. So let's take a moment and um, do this simple mind cleansing ritual. So if you would bring your hands together and take a deep breath in and let it out and imagine that water is pouring over your hands and now lather them with soap and let the water run over them. And now on the count of three, as you're lathering your hands, don't forget to keep doing that simple ritual. We're going to sing happy birthday two times to Sheila and to feel the joy of singing together. So here we go, two times. Ready? One, two, three. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy, happy birthday, birthday dear Sheila. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Sheila. Happy birthday to you. Now, just have a, a little silly giggle over that one, just to also acknowledge how silly this is. So when you wash your hands, you could sing to yourself for two rounds of Happy Birthday or some other song. But um, it brings together the idea of ritual, joy, singing, and um, cleansing. So next slide. So here are some resources for you. Marsha mentioned The Caregiver's Tao Teaching, which is a lovely book. And um, it has wonderful quotes in it for you to use, to read. And um, the second is our Seasons of Care Meditations. And you can download um, a sample of it. And you can also go to CD Baby and see it. And the third is Full Catastrophe Living, which is the mindfulness-based stress reduction that um, Marsha mentioned. So we are going to have some time for questions and answers. but. We want to really thank all of you for your participation today and for taking the time to integrate self-care practice into your day. Special thanks to Family Caregiver Alliance for being a leader in caring for family caregivers. Next slide. So um, we know that it's really challenging to integrate wellness tools into your life. And Seasons of Care is starting weekly reminders using both the contemplative and the expressive arts. And if you would like to be on our distribution list to receive wellness tools and reminders, um, there is info at transitionalkeys.org if you send us an email. And if you have questions and they don't get answered today, you can also send an email. Or give us a call at 914-517-5353. And we hope that as you continue on your journey of caregiving, that care for yourself is really an integral and vital part through the contemplative and the expressive arts. So thank you. And thank you so much also, Marsha and Andrea, for joining us. And um, at this time, I would like to open it up for questions. I will give you guys a few minutes to type in your questions, and we can get answers um, straight from Marsha and Andrea right now. And Marsha and Andrea, Sheila just wanted to let you know that that was so nice and she is smiling from ear to ear right now. <laughs> That's nice to know. 
Okay. So I do have um, my first question here. Um, it's actually for me. Um, the webinar will be played, um, or I'm sorry, will be put up on Family Caregiver's website. Um, I will transition to the next slide after questions are over, and it will have our web address on there. If you visit that link um, and go into our educational file, then we will be able to post that up there, and it will take about a week. So um, give it some time, and the um, PowerPoint presentation will also be up there as well. And um, this is for either one of you. Um, are there stats that show these types of activities and that will improve the health of caregivers, and where can I find them? I, I couldn't. Under, I was. It was. That was a little foggy. I couldn't hear the question clearly. No problem. I can repeat it. Um, are there statistics that show these types of activities improving um, the physical health of caregivers, and where can I find those? There's a lot of statistics about mindfulness meditation, um, and we can, if you, I can send you, if the person was to send me that question directly after the webinar, I can send that link. And there's research also about the well-being, health and well-being of creative art. So we can send those links, articles, and things if she, if she connects us after the webinar. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, and there's also research about um, writing and the immune system. So, um, you know, sometimes you can go into each art form specifically, and sometimes there's kind of a more global framework in thinking about it. Wonderful. And I also have um, a question. Are there art classes specifically designed for caregivers? And if so, how do those differentiate from um, typical art classes? Well, it's a matter um, of yes, there are. And um, there's actually, I guess this past year I was in Princeton at a training that the National Center for Creative Aging did. And while there, the Princeton Arts Council shared um, a arts program that they have that's visual arts for caregivers where um, and it's a pretty it's you know a pretty high level of art so um, they have both painting and sculpture for caregivers family caregivers so I would say one good way to find something like that is through your local arts council that's a really good place to start but yes, they are in existence. And it will be great to know more about them. OK. Um, and Michelle would like to know, um, she's never done any meditations before, and she's, frankly, a bit intimidated. Are there any tips for a first timer? Yeah. Um, don't consider yourself a first timer. <laughs> Go go easy, go gentle. I, I would suggest if you can take a workshop, to take a workshop um, because there's something about you know, the guidance of an experienced teacher is very helpful. Um, so I think those are three, those are some tips that I would give a beginner. It's, it's well worth uh, taking the time to integrate it into your daily life. The, the research is overwhelming in terms of the value of it. Our meditations are, um, we hope that they are welcoming to a caregiver. You're, you can sample them on CD Baby. We can send you a link where you can listen to the whole catch your breath. I don't mean to talk around the question, but I think you know, the, the, the res appropriate response is to, if you can take the time to take a workshop, that's probably the best way to start. Well, and also, I think the thinking goes that even if you just add 10 minutes of sitting quietly um, to your day, that's a start. Michelle, it's a good way just to take 10 minutes. You don't have to take like 20 minutes or a half an hour. I think the thing is to start to integrate it into your day. And there are many different meditation practices. Some focus on, you know, counting the in-breath. Some focus on counting the out breath. Some focus on not counting at all. There are a lot of different um, techniques. 
So I think Martha's suggestion, if you can, to find a class is a good one. Um, but also through the media, you know, there are credible meditations that you can get also, you know, through um, social media. So. Also, I think one thing that we've experienced a lot and it is that one of the big barriers for caregivers with wellness tools is to take the time of the day to use them for yourself. And that's why we're going to have these weekly reminders. It's kind of like being a wellness coach. And there'll be, a, there'll be an exchange of, med, of contemplative and expressive arts. So you might want to consider signing up for our reminders. And that might help you cultivate you know, your nascent meditation practice. OK. And then also, um, are there meditations that um, can be done with my loved one who has dementia, like meditations they can do together? Absolutely. You know, I think um, one of the um, challenges in that is um, how you language it. So, you know, what you might say to a person that has dementia might be really different. You might not use the word meditation. You might just say, let's take a, a moment, a few moments, just to sit quietly together and just gently breathe. So I think finding a way to um, practice together, um, you know, be adaptive, I think, in that situation is what I would recommend. And um, maybe just try start something like that with just a few minutes. I don't know, Marsha, you might have a comment on that one. Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting to hear the question because, you know, my dad has dementia and, and he and I do sit together. Uh, we don't sit for longer than five minutes. Really, it's three and a half has kind of been the, the norm. And I approach it. I don't use the word meditation. I just say, Dad, let's just sit in time and space together. And it's, it's a wonderful thing for me. And I think it's also a wonderful thing for him because he's now, he's mentioned it. You know, he said, can we do that sit thing again? So, um, and again, I think when Andre said, you know, be adaptive, it's you, you know the person that you're with better than, than anyone. But the more comfortable you get with the sitting, you'll be able to, to know where to take it. And I want to address a few of the questions I'm getting about um, the actual webinar itself. Um, you can print and download the PowerPoint slides off of our website. If you give us about a week, again, we will have that up. And um, the next slide will show you where you can find that information. Um, and we do do them multiple days depending upon, um, depending upon our speakers and our schedule as well. So they are not always on Tuesdays. Um, and then the question for you guys is, do you guys ever give these presentations to staff at day centers or nursing homes or anything like that? Yes, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Besides, this is kind of our work, you know, with family caregivers, but we've done very extensive work with staff and healthcare professionals um, a lot. So um, some of our tools were developed in a hospice setting with the hospice staff. Um, in New York. So um, we've done, you know, a whole series of care for healthcare professionals and we've done them in person and also on webinars. So and we have a lot. I have to say personally, it's, I, it's, it's a much, it's a much, as you can imagine, it's a much more um, fulfilling experience doing it live than in this form of a webinar for obvious reasons. I mean, we're talking about some very high touch uh, tools, which, you know, to honor them is to do it, to do it live is really quite wonderful. Yeah. And we hope, I wanted, yeah. Yeah, ahead, I wanted sorry. to say something. We haven't talked about venting. And um, when Marsha and I were designing it, we thought, oh, so we put venting in or not. But it, I don't want to, um, by any shape or form, not acknowledge that sometimes also caregivers need opportunities to really vent um, and let go and that um, we have been working also on rituals that really 
support caregivers to vent and let go because I, I think it's, you know, you have to include that sometimes as a self-care practice as well. And have another. Um, no matter how hard I try, it's extremely difficult to divert my attention to calm my heart and my stomach. Where do I go for a strong diversionary tactics? <laughs> well, um, one thing that I would recommend there, if you can, is um, a form of physical body movement or release, yoga or tai chi are excellent forms. I think sometimes something like that really needs a physical approach or swimming, whatever it is. But I think you have to move the energy, you know, and have a physical, um, some form of physical release as part of your self-care practice. Mm -hmm. Uh, probably singing would help that as well. I, I, would, sing, I would imagine singing or dancing, you know, put on your iPad and rock out. <laughs> yeah, both of those should really be helpful for that. And I have Lisa, um, who says, thank you so much. It's very helpful. This has been um, awakening, and she's been longing to do expressive art. She would like to know, what is the iPad app for the drawing or painting? Uh -huh. the, well, the one, let me just pull it up. The one that I used is called, oh, where did it go? It's called Draw Free, D-R-A-W-F-R-E-E. -E. There are a bunch of them now on, there are a bunch of different apps. That's just the one that I feel most comfortable with, D-R-A-W-F-R-E-E. -E. And it's a free, it's a free app. And I tell you, when I was in the hospital for those first six days and nights with my dad, I was thrilled that I had it. I, it was really, it was great. And if you find any others that you that you like, please let us know. It seems like every every week more and more it gets delivered to the App Store. And I have a couple comments here as well that I would like to um, read off for everyone. Um, really simple, fun for caregivers. Blow bubbles; it brings joy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and daily practice of exercise classes. Um, Janet found that to be very helpful for her. And also, I would like to um, say that if you want to be signed up for their weekly reminders, as they had mentioned, um, is it correct that you would like them to email you at your, um, your email address that's provided? Yes. Okay, great. So if you, again, if you would like those week, weekly reminders, please bi visit the info at transitionalkeys.org, and they will get you taken care of. We've already gotten some email from some of the people out there, which is great. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing, the technology. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then also... I have another question. I have tried meditation before and can't seem to focus. Am I doing something wrong? <laughs> hmm. I don't think that, I think um, one of the things about meditation is um, sometimes people use the expression, oh, monkey mind. It's often used as a way to describe your mind. And am I doing something wrong, I think, is, kind of like monkey mind trying to, in a way, to trap you into thinking you're doing something wrong. I think the, um, you know, if you can't focus sometimes, that's what your meditation is. The, uh, the more you can just sit and just follow your breath, I would start with really simple, maybe the best way to start would be to breathe in and then just Focus on your out-breath and let the in-breath come in and then let the out-breath release and, and just let it go. You know, also I'd like to add that just as Richard Davidson, you know, said that there, it's like sports. There's so many different kinds. Maybe you have to shop around a little more and find the, the, the approach, the technique, that form that, that you really want to embrace. It could be that you may be the yoga nidra, lying down on your back and getting into your body and letting go. Maybe that's the better way in. Um, so I would think, you know, just 
try again because of, surely you'll find one that fits like a glove. And on that topic, I wanted to um, let all the listeners out there know from Joy, um, she wanted to say that um, meditation is not typically always what you think. You could do gardening or swimming, and she's found weeding is very good because she's <laughs> felt that she's been able to um, delete the bad from her life uh, oh. during weeding. No, and that's a great, I think that's a really important point because it's a metaphor. And the more you can find those metaphors, the symbolic things like that, that's terrific. Thank you so much for that. Okay, and then um, I am just going to take one final question, and um, that is re regarding uh, meditation and cultures. Um, do you find that meditation can be used across all cultures, or um, how do you guys feel about that? I think um, the, the question is, is backing into um, some some issue of maybe religion and culture and that you know the this this form of meditation is to use the word secular it is free of dogma it is free of any religious association so I think that it is applicable all over the map wonderful and it will, and it, and it will not and it will not interfere or challenge with anyone's religious belief and practice Okay. Well, um, I, that is all the time for questions we have. Again, if you do have any other questions, please feel free to email them at the email address on your screen. Give you a second there to get it down. I'm actually going to switch over now. This is the um, Family Caregiver Alliance website here, and that is where you will be able to find this webinar. Again, if you give us about a week, we will have that up. You can print the slides, you can listen to the webinar, you can send it to send it to a friend or a family member, and um, let them know. Again, thank you so much for your participation in our webinar, Seasons of Care. Please feel free to contact Family Caregiver Alliance with any questions. Our number is on the screen, but just to reiterate, it's 1-800-445-8106. And again, thank you also to Andrea and Marsha for joining us this afternoon. And thank you and all. We want, to shout, we, we want to shout out to Sheila for letting, her, for letting us use her name. <laughs> yes, thank you, Sheila, so much. And at this time, the seminar is now concluded. Thank you. Thank you.